Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Plummer, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our second Greening the Landscape conversation. These conversations afford an opportunity to learn and interact with experts regarding issues of importance. They're part of the knowledge mobilization pillar of our Greening Landscape Consortium and contribute to building the collective capacity of the Canadian urban tree value chain by developing and mobilizing scientific knowledge with in a collaborative network. If you're not a member of the consortium, I'd encourage you to check it out via the link provided in the chat below. Our conversation today is about defining Canada's urban tree value chain, a subject I've recently learned a lot about. We know the demand for nature-based solutions to climatic and other challenges is increasing markedly, and that it represents a wealth of opportunities for the Canadian urban tree value chain. A value chain includes all activities required to conduct a product from start to finish. This growing demand, however, also highlights several pressing questions. And today, we're incredibly fortunate to be joined by three individuals who have a wealth of experience and expertise with the urban tree value chain from different perspectives. And it's my, uh, my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce them at this time. So first and foremost, we have Dr. Amy Bowen, who's the Director of Consumer Insights at Vineland Research and Innovation Centre. With 12 years of experience in research and innovation, she leads a team of researchers to understand the drivers that impact preference and choice to create value-added products from the horticultural sector. Amy has a BSc Honours from the University of Guelph in Molecular Biology and Genetics and a PhD in Biological Sciences from Brock University. And Amy, I just have to say, great choice of schools. Uh, I also am an alum of U of G and, and work at Brock. So great choice of schools. Uh, please welcome to the panel. Uh, next, we have Tony DiGiovanni. He's the ex Executive Director of Landscape Ontario Horticultural Trades Association, one of the world's largest and most active horticultural associations. Prior to, to starting our conversation today, Tony was telling us a little bit about what's coming up on their horizon and its incredible busy schedule. The organization enjoys a membership of over 3,000 companies, publishes two magazines, coordinates three trade shows, and hosts over 250 seminars and workshops. Landscape Ontario is unique in that it represents many sectors of the value chain. The association represents those that design, install, and maintain landscapes, gardens, and green spaces, as well as growers and garden centers. In addition to his role as Executive Director of Landscape Ontario, Tony also serves as the Executive Director of the Ontario Horticulture Trades Foundation and Canada Blooms Flower and Garden Show. So if there's anything related to landscapes in Ontario, Tony's your go-to person. Last, but certainly not least, we have Jason Krupp, He's been the general manager at Moser Landscape Group, uh, located in Waterloo, Ontario, for over 25 years. He's a passionate advocate for urban tree establishment and green infrastructure solutions in general. His role at Moser Landscape Group deals with cities, municipalities, consultants, developers, and architects on all level of landscape construction. We are having a fantastic uh, conversation about some of the equipment that Jason, Jason uses to get the job done and, and really put these visions into action. Uh, Moser Landscape Group has been in business since 1983 and has a great reputation for planning and landscaping. Jason brings a unique perspective to the group. He started his career on the cruise and channeling that experience into his current role as general manager overseeing and managing the construction company. I want to again welcome our panelists and just say Thank you so much for joining us today in this conversation. I'm, I'm extremely excited to uh, pose questions to you and hear from your diverse areas of expertise. In terms of, of housekeeping, um, I have the, the privilege again of moderating our Greening the Landscape conversation today. And in that capacity, I, I have two main roles. Uh, I started out by crafting some initial questions for our panelists, reflecting issues that I anticipate are really of keen interest to all of you, our audience members and consortium members that are joining us today. Uh, second of all, I'm gonna communicate questions from you to our panel. 
And, and if you were adding up the years of experience uh, in the introduction, and I, I did this last night as I was preparing for our conversation day, I believe we, we have on the call today over 60 plus years of collective experience. And that's really a, just an incredibly rich opportunity for learning and sharing knowledge. And so what I want to encourage all of you as we're listening to the responses to these first couple of questions, please start typing your questions into the chat box. I know there's a limited number of characters. If you need to put in two or three uh, different uh, chat entries to round out your questions. And I'm, I'm gonna make sure that those are posed to our panelists. So with, with that said, uh, I wanna start the panel. I can hardly wait. Let me get a thumbs up from our panelists. Are they ready to go? Fantastic, we got three thumbs up. We're, we're ready to roll. So I'm gonna start out by um, asking you a question and, and I wanna go back to my introduction. I, I really briefly, and I wanna say inadequately, described the value chain. I was preparing for a conversation day, reading about value chains, but it's certainly not a, an area I have expertise in. And so, um, you know, I think it's really important for this conversation that we all share an understanding of the value chain and that's something that we're gonna really use as a, as a touchstone today. So Amy, I wanna maybe start with yourself. I know you've done so much pioneering research in this area with your role in environment. Um, would you mind starting us off today by explaining, you know, what is a value chain and maybe illustrating it using the concept of urban forestry here in Canada? Sure, happy to do that and then happy to be part of the conversation today. So um, thanks for having me. So, you know, as you know, you said, Ryan, sort of in your introduction is, you know, a value chain is, you know, thinking of all the people, um, all all the participants that basically go from getting something from start to finish. So when we were thinking of it in this context, it was really from how do trees go from nurseries to being planted in cities? So what are all the steps it takes? What are all the processes that go into it? And I think the word value chain is often a bit of a misnomer because it's rarely a straight line. Um, and it's rarely, you know, like an easy kind of, you know, like one way. It's usually, you, know, you could think of it as, as a web or an interconnection of information and products that sort of gets you there. So some people um, will even think of it as sort of thinking of like an eco system, sort of everything that you need in order to be able to make something successful. Um, and so what we were sort of looking at was trying to understand what like what matters, who were the people, who were the, the, the sort of, the, you talk about sort of the actors along the way, the key participants, the bottlenecks, like where everything sort of moves to be able to make something successful. And so um, we looked at it as well from the, the, the perspective of creating value for the sector versus just a supply chain, which is really about just thinking of how does a product get from point A to B, point B and, and who value, like who gets the most out of it, but thinking of how do we grow value for the entire sector by incorporating as many people as possible. So instead of say growing one piece of the pie growing the entire pie to make everybody you know um, invested and wanting to sort of get that sector to move forward so what we found when we were sort of looking at this and if we think of it from that sort of like urban forestry model is that there were sort of two main things that we had to be looking at and they were actually it seems intuitive, but they were actually quite different in how they interacted. One is sort of the flow of products. Everybody was pretty clear how you got trees, you know, into the ground, but it was the flow of information that created a lot more maybe opportunities and challenges of who speaks to who, when who speaks, like when they should be speaking to each other. What are the different timelines that people have? So say a municipality wants something planted next year, but a nursery needs three years to be able to grow up those trees. So there was a lot more kind of, you know, um, you know, details that sort of went along the way. So what we did to try to figure out you know, to figure this out was to, to sort of do some interviews where we talk to different people to get those, get that real sort of understanding. And what the really positive and encouraging thing that came out of it was that was really, um, um, was fantastic, was that everybody wanted to see value. Everybody wanted to see sort of improvement and ways of making this work. They, they want to make it, you know, it's sort of a, a team effort. And they were very appreciative of like, oh, I had never thought of that before. Or, oh, yeah, that is right. I could talk to that person or I could involve them more in the process or, you know, planning things out that way. So that was something that was really like you know really really sort of information like important because we saw it was that communication breakdown which is where a lot of the gaps you know occurred and where you know um you, you could sort of see a lot of areas for opportunity and so you know you know communication having more knowledge and education having more standard specifications you know things like that are things that um were sort of seen as real opportunities but with every opportunity presents the challenges of, of how do you put that in place with there's being so many different and it being such a complex interdependent sort of network so there's lots more 
more I can say on it, but I know that there's sort of, you know, um, that, that's not the whole focus of this conversation. So I'll leave it at that. And if people have more specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to address those as we go along. Hey, Ryan, can, can I just underscore and give some examples of what Amy's just talking about? Real life examples. You know what, Tony, you, you just beat me to the punch. I was just going to pick up on, on a really critical piece that Amy said. And, you know, she, I, I don't want to misquote Amy, but, you know, you said how people were surprised, right, about this value chain. And, and maybe this was a new revelation and awareness to them. And I was going to just ask Tony and Jason, from your perspective, you know, was this something new? And, and yeah, if you could give us some examples, that'd be fantastic, Tony. Yeah, so, so, so one example actually involves Vineland, right? So, so probably about 10 years ago, um, we were looking at uh, issues and problems with, with trying to get survival of trees on highways. You know, mo most, most trees that you plant on highways are planted in concrete, <laughs> and then you expect them to live, right? And, and so, so uh, we asked Vineland, you know, we invested $74,000, uh, and uh, they came up with, with protocols on how to actually plant in, in, in terrible areas. And, and out of that, that 70, 74,000, this is a real example, uh, it led to a $10 million Highway of Heroes project. We're, we're planting 2 million trees along the Highway of Heroes using the Vineland, the, the Vineland protocols. And it started off as a small project trying to figure out, you know, you know how to get these trees to survive on highways. And and uh, a huge like that the, the the upscale in value based on on just that little example, uh, and um, I've got another couple of examples. Um, you know, I'm I'm involved in a, in a a coalition called the Green Infrastructure Coalition, and uh, what we're trying to do is is uh, just raise awareness for for the the value of living green uh, uh, infrastructure. I like I like to kind of you know cure, say it curing plant blindness is what we're trying to do, and and uh, um, one of the members of of the of the uh, alliance is the Greenbelt uh, organization, and they paid for a research study uh, on the economic impact of of the green infrastructure uh, industry, and came up with uh, you know eight billion dollars in economic impact. 121,000 jobs. This is just Ontario. Uh, and it all starts with $1 billion worth of plants that are grown on farms, like the, the, the trees, the nurseries, and, and the uh, uh, floriculture end of things. So that's two, two examples of, of value chain. Tony, I can't thank you enough for, for bringing those examples to our attention. I think they really ground us. And Jason, I want to bring you into this, this conversation about the value chain. I mean, how does this strike you from your, you know, GM position in Moser when we start talking about value chain? Is this, you know, a new, a new idea? Or does this really resonate uh, with with the work that you do and make good sense as a way of thinking about this in Ontario? Well, I, I agree 100% because I, when I got an opportunity to meet Darby, we were actually uh, doing a lunch and learn because of the stresses we face in our industry that I brought every engineering, consulting, architect, and every municipality I could think of to this to discuss the challenges that we've been facing in this industry and su suggestions and, and issues that we've seen underlying. And I brought her in as well as uh, Grobark to talk about soils and, and plant specifications and what, what's gonna work the best. And when an opportunity came around for us to help with this Vineland research in, uh, endeavor, we, we jumped on this. This is exactly what needs to happen in our industry. And it, it's got to be with all parties because we are seeing huge challenges that have, in my opinion, only been getting, getting more complex. And uh, we need to get real answers and, and, and real ideas out there that are going to make these successful. And uh, I know we've been doing a lot of internal promotion up through through our organization. And when this came about with Darby, we it was just a no-brainer. So we've we've contributed to her, to this campaign because we see such a value in it and also uh ryan wouldn't mind uh, um also looking at um you know amy amy talked about the uh the definition of value chain from, from a, a economic perspective and then she touched on on um you know value from the public perspective as well and 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 the um fr from a public perspective <laughs> the public perspective uh, the urban tree canopy 
it, it, you know, used to be seen as just pretty. You know, it's beautiful. You know, and and uh, there is so much more value that 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 uh, it brings to to society to the public. I mean, there's there's environmental, there's health, aesthetic, there's therapeutic, legacy, spiritual. There's so many benefits, but there's also energy savings. Uh, there's the increase in home values, the oxygen production, the flooding protection, the CO2 sink, the the pollution and dust control, the soil erosion control, and and uh, it goes on and on and on. And, and that, that's part of the value uh, uh, chain as well, you know? It's, 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 it's the benefits to society in general. It's an enhancing lives. If I can comment a little further too uh, about that is each one of those are different. Each one of those don't get executed the same. You made the example of highway planting. Well, that's a different planting than a street tree planting in an interior subdivision. Or if we're doing cooling trenches on a storm pond or a storm pond, all those are not a one fit, one process fits all. All of them have their own independent challenges, but it's not treated that way in our industry. And uh, that that's the importance I see with this uh, in, initiative to, to make sure that we're getting all the information out there to make these projects successful. I think that was a key thing that came out from a lot of, um, uh, you know, from some of the interviews that we did is that, you know, everybody knows the value of, you know, sort of hard, you know, hard landscapes and of infrastructure from that standpoint, right? But we need to put more of a value on green infrastructure and on its value and on the establishment costs and factoring that into it. So it's not just about, you know, planting the tree in the ground, but thinking about how does that then get to the point where it's creating that urban canopy and it's creating all of those benefits that Tony was just referring to. And that's kind of the next piece if someone were to ask me what's next in this sort of value chain research is figuring out, okay, the consumer, the public, they're a massive piece of all of this because they want trees, but they need to understand where all of this comes and how it all fits in. And the, and, you know, and, and, and the value, the times, you know, everything else that sort of goes into that. Um, and, you know, and in terms of building that. And so I, I think that's another piece of it that is not as well understood is, is how the public, you know, is, is really viewing this in those different, you know, as Jason was just saying, every, every, where you're planting is going to be a little bit different, what people's perceptions are, what actors roles are in it. And 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 how that contribution is going to be important, and and those things all still need to be sorted through. You know, it, it never ceases to amaze me when you get panelists of your caliber together that are passionate, enthusiasm, have this depth of expertise. The conversation just flows, and it's it's almost like you know you saw my list of questions that I created before we had this panel because you know it, it just led it perfectly to, to the second line of questioning that I wanted to bring up. And, um, you know, Tony, Jason, and Amy, you all touched on, on this idea of our urban tree canopy, different values to the urban tree canopy. But, but even more so than that, you know, the, the kind of um, colloquially for, for many of us, you know, planting the tree, we focus on that part of it, right? So when the government of Canada recently says, oh, we're going to plant 2 billion trees, um, you know, that's, you know, a, a focus often comes into that tree planning part of it. But, but, you know, as you all spoke to, that misses so much of what else we consider uh, that we have to do to actually grow that urban tree canopy and get those benefits that we're all so uh, well aware of. And if I think back to our, our first conversation in this, in this series, you know, we really focused on COVID-19 and how has that shifted substantially those values that we have even beyond you know, their importance that we had prior to COVID. So coming back to this, this question, I think we should dig into it a little bit more today. Um, and, and maybe I can start with you again, Amy, and ask, you know, to start from that tree planning and kind of pick up from your last comment, can, can you maybe start to dig into what is or why this is such a value chain issue? And then after that, maybe Tony and Jason, you can kind of really think from your perspectives, you know, if we look out at that whole value chain, what are some of the really important challenges that you're seeing from a value chain, you know, from your part of the value chain that we need to go beyond just this focus on planting trees and how does a value chain help us accomplish that? So Amy, do you mind kicking this off again? 
Sure. So, you know, I would say sort of from that value chain perspective, it's it's a grand initiative. It's a fantastic, you know, initiative, but it's grand in terms of thinking about all the different parts and pieces that go into making it. So, you know, if you think of sort of opportunities, you know, you like you need that, you're going to have to have, you know, a lot of communication. You're going to have to have understanding, you know, sort of, I guess, sort of specifications. It's not going to be the same tree in all the places. So certain parts of Canada are maybe going to need different species selections, different, you know, based on soil, climate, all of these types of things that are going to have to sort of play into it as well as okay great we want to plant all these trees do we even have this many trees available you know when you think of from that um the supply perspective you know of of, of doing things you know i recently moved and they're looking at you know making an addition and just you think of the supply chain and everywhere of what we're looking at we're doing a study on something else we can't get the cups that we serve the apples in because of supply chain issues so where are we going to find two million trees from you know um you know to be able to get into the ground to be able to sort of do all of this and then what are the specific specifications as well so that we do it for success so that's another thing to be thinking about is is this an initiative we don't want it to be an initiative from a value chain perspective where it's a numbers game of like we just need to get two million trees in the ground we want it to be a successful to to have that long-term benefit of creating that urban canopy and so thinking of all of those things that are going to be so important about forecasting planning specifications survival to have those long-term benefits you know so you know as you know the, the highway of heroes initiative that tony mentioned earlier you want it to be similar to that where we can see establishment and where you can use that as a you know a foundational model of success and not just a, a target that we're sort of checking off to say that we did it so from a value chain perspective i think those are the, the sort of key things from sort of the top of my mind of of how do you get everybody working together when everybody's um also priorities are going to be a little bit different depending on where they are um and what what they have access to Amy, you've described a, a, a wonderful puzzle and, and a great <laughs> a great opportunity too. Yeah. Like, like the uh, the t two billion tree program uh, is is a is is a wonderful way to get everybody on the same page. It's it's a it's a unifying thing, you know. Uh -huh. And and um, there are so many different layers. Uh, and uh, um, and w one thing for, is for sure that that the government's not going to do it by themselves and that we all have to be involved and we all have to take responsibility and we all have to communicate the why of why we have to take responsibility and and it's all all from different perspectives and so so it's it's a it's a wonderful challenge and and uh um fr from our perspective we've we've had a um a, a chance to be involved right so we've we visited the the uh, um Enter can uh, and and um, gave them our ideas of how it could be done, and we we also asked uh, uh, that we be a partner, uh, and uh, we were successful in actually you know becoming a partner financially, and and uh, we created a new organization uh, called Canadian Trees for Life, in in order to 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 be the uh, um, uh, the the group that brings people together. And and really, that that's that's uh, uh, our our main uh, main focus is let's get every uh, affinity group out there, let's get every stakeholder uh, to buy into this idea of taking responsibility to plant more trees and care for more trees, and let and let's do it in a way that's going to be successful using the Vineland protocols, uh, and uh, um, you know we've started doing it already. Uh, and uh, we're using the, the the model of the highway heroes because that that's that's how how we we did it in in, in that in that uh, uh, project, and we're we're expanding that model. But but the key to it is getting people aligned, all, all going in the same direction. And there's so so many people that that can be involved, right? Like it's it's uh, you know the, the the like who's the public, right? It's it's the homeowner. It's the uh, industrial, commercial, institutional property owners. It's the owners and, and managers. It's the multi-residential property owners. It's the churches, the synagogues. The, the you know, like like everybody has has a piece in this thing, and and uh, um, it's the governments. You know, the municipalities, the the provincial governments, the federal governments. They all have land, and uh, um, the, the the goal, in in a general sense, is forty percent urban tree cover. And it's, it's mostly the urban areas that need it, the urban areas and the transportation hubs. So, so we're, we're, 
uh, we're so glad that the government came up with this broad idea and we know that they can't do it themselves. And so all of us have to be involved. Everyone who's listening to this broadcast has to be involved. And uh, you know, we'd love to take responsibility to, to get people together. You know, so. When, and, and Tony, I, I, I want to just pause because I think you know, that is such a critical take home message from today. And it, it's going to be one of a, a few that I want to come back to at the end. But your message that you know, it has to be involvement from the entire value chain from all of those actors in the value chain that you mentioned and others. And I want to I want to come back to the idea of the consortium and really it's the whole consortium is about connecting those actors across the value chain and starting to work together towards some of these goals. And so thank you. That was such a powerful message. And and Jason, I want to come back to you now and and honestly I'm not picking on you. I just have such an affinity though for so I, I always am cognizant as a moderator that I shouldn't talk about myself, but I'm going to take a second because when I um, when I was a young lad and had a lot more hair, um, you know, I, I actually had my own landscaping company uh, just 15 minutes west of, of Waterloo, and that's that was my university uh, job, I guess, throughout university. That's what I did. So I just have have so much respect, uh, you know, for for Moser and what you do. And I was thinking to myself as we're we're listening and, and how you were connecting these dots. If we if we go back a little bit from tree planting, and I know this is what I experienced when I had, uh, you know, my landscape company was, if we're talking about canopy cover, we, we need to think about species selection, we need to think about tree establishment, we need to think about maintenance. And one of the things in preparing for today, I was reading about Moser, I mean, it sounds like that your company does it all, right? Like you you do it from start to finish. and so. I was thinking from your perspective in the value chain, you know, how, how do you see the consortium or the value chain being, a, how can you approach it to leverage what you do to ultimately expand the canopy cover across all those different things that are, you know, that go, go beyond just the planting of trees? Yeah, so when Tony, Tony summed it up, it, it's a puzzle piece. I mean, it really is. There's just so many different factors and it's not a one answer fits all. And that's the biggest challenge we've been trying to advocate for when we, right from construct uh, contract creation, uh, one of our big things that we've been advocating for is to stop the bad behaviors. And what they're doing, unfortunately, in the contracts is trying to do it through special provisions and, and trying to get everyone to maintain these jobs by a unit rate to get a plant in the ground. And unfortunately, all that's doing in, in our view is taking good contractors Bad behaviors aren't going to probably use plant plan to maintain it after they plant it anyway. So, if we're bidding against them and we're planning on bidding against them with maintenance, and they're just planting it in and running away, while well, we we're out, we're you basically just cut the good contractors are planning on maintaining these projects out of the equation. So, we we've been advocating and we've seen it starting to come a long way within contract construction where they're actually itemizing a maintenance. And that does two things. A, it shows what the person, what the contractors are willing to put into it, as well as if it's not being done, there's still money in that contract to maybe utilize that monies elsewhere by getting somebody in there to do it. Um, and then maybe that company will have trouble bidding on the next project because they didn't uphold what they're going to do. But there's just so many challenges that are that are being done. You know, uh, we do, like you said, we're into a little bit of everything, and and that's because we want to control the ability to do our jobs on time for our client and, and get them done. And we've been finding more challenges as, as it goes on with getting these trees to the job site because maybe a road builder wants it in that day and it's 35 degrees and maybe it could wait and it should wait, but we're gonna force it because it's a check mark and the engineering consultant is treating it like an item. I want the item done with the light standards, we're gonna put the trees in and then, and it, we're always challenged with a living, breathing thing that we're dealing with versus what people understand is just get the job done. So it's it's such a difficult industry that has so many parts and pieces. It's a puzzle and how it all comes together is inherently gonna have effects on the success of the project. So when we're forcing certain things because it's just an item to get done, it may have repercussions on the long-term outcome of those projects. And we're seeing more and more decisions, something like you said with uh, nursery selections. The nurseries are trying to forecast what's being 
uh, planned on and, and they may not have those. So, you know, it, it's been a construction contractor kind of battle over the years that what we spec is what you have to provide. But we're starting to see a little bit of a change here where I've been advocating for the architects to maybe go to the nursery and look because red maple, unfortunately, has been picked through and you're getting the best of the worst of that time of year. But right beside that pile is a maple that would work, would still be successful in the landscape. And there's an abundance of beautiful trees. They just don't know that. So uh, I know talking with uh, NVK, who we, we do a lot of work with as well, they like that. And and it never used to be the case where, um, you know, it, it was to go it was always the contractor's responsibility to bring it in. But we're seeing some benefits as we evolve how we get these projects done. And, and I think there's some good changes that this consortium will bring uh, all different perspectives of these challenges from, from architects, engineering, uh, government, municipality, city to get all the parties involved with people that are looking to improve the outcomes, which if we're trying to plant 2 billion trees, it better be successful. Jason, Jason is, is so right on, on so many things here. Um, the, 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 the consortium uh, has a huge role to play in, in connecting people, right? So, so, so Jason talked about everybody's different perspectives. And uh, with today's communication uh, technology, uh, with the fact that, you know, designers know what they're putting in, in a plan, municipalities have budgets. They know how many trees they're going to plant. For, for two, three, four years. They know what their budgets are. Uh, um, it, it, they know what, what species they want. You know, it takes, takes a grower, you know, anywhere from three to five to seven years to, to, to grow a plant. But, but there's also a lag time between the design and, and, and the installation. So, so if there's a, a facilitation of communication between all parties, so that the, the municipality can say, okay, we wanna plant so many trees in the next five years, and these are the varieties, and species that we want, and and uh, therefore, Mr. Grower or, or Miss Grower, you you can you can do this, right? Um, you know where the market's going to be, and and uh, uh, you know from a grower perspective, I've been involved in in, in situations where, you know, a conservation authority says we want so we want here's our goal to plant so many trees, so so and we want them to be all natives. And then so a nursery goes and, and they, they start to ramp up on, on the trees that, that, that they said were, were, were needed. Uh, and in the end, the money ran out, you know? So, so, so they, grew in, they grew a crop that they had no, no market for. Like they, there, there's all that stuff could be corrected with good communication, you know? And, and uh, the consortium's big role here is, is getting everybody <laughs> together. You know, that's, that's, that's the beauty of this thing. So, well done, I, I love it, Tony. I literally am, am writing down some of these key takeaways that we're going to go back to. And I think, you know, a number of your statements we could just like put on a t shirt and, and I think we could get them for all consortium members because they're just such poignant messages, so clear, right? And, and I just love that you're able to bring these forward from, from your wealth of experience. I want to I wanna pause for a second and just share with the three of you because I know we're running a dual system today that our audience numbers today are through the roof. We're being joined uh, by a number of, of individuals and organizations throughout Ontario. Uh, we're, we're thrilled with uh, the, the folks that are with us today. And I also wanna encourage our audience members to take a second and please, if you have questions for Tony, Amy, and Jason, uh, put them in that chat. The questions are already just scrolling across my screen. Uh, so I'm gonna ask one last one. I'm gonna ask you to keep your Remarks uh, fairly brief, one or two minutes each, maybe two minutes each, and then we'll uh, open it up after this to some audience questions because I know everybody wants to ask the three of you questions. But I get to I get to ask a, a final question from myself, and I'm going to ask you to take a second from your position on on the urban tree value chain, and I want you to identify the one or two opportunities that you see particularly from your experience or your position for the urban tree value chain today. Okay, I, I can start. <laughs> awesome, Jason, go for it, all yours. 
Well, I, I know, again, as an installer of, of the plants, and, and I've seen my share of uh, successful and un unsuccessful projects, and uh, nine times out of ten, it, it's just lack of maintenance and, and carrying through with, uh, with, with continued care of, of the plant material. Because, again, we're living... We're dealing with living and breathing items that um, that if they're not cared for and they're not quite rooted and and thriving, they will fail in times of drought. Which, with climate change, I would say we are seeing drastic uh, runs of of um, you know drought and then all of a sudden crazy amounts of rain. And uh, it's uncharacteristic from what we've experienced years before to what the highs and lows are today. So when we look at constructing these contracts, which I've elaborated on a little bit already, it, it's the it's it's carrying through with a maintenance, uh, creating a maintenance within that contract to ensure that it's continuing after the plants are from the nursery and put into the ground. And um, you know, and that goes not just for trees; it goes for sod and all, sod care and all that type of stuff. Where all of a sudden, you know, we we leave the job site; it's complete, and nobody's watering or maintaining it, and the site suffers. And you know, uh, if things start to decline fairly quickly, so the value of of maintenance beyond the install is such an important part, and that's what I think I would see the biggest. What I'd be advocating for the most is uh, to ensure that there's money's left in the contract. It's shown as a paid item that you're getting people to show what it's going to cost them to maintain the sites, so that people understand what that is, and they're just not planting it and leaving the site. Yeah, thanks, Jason. That's that's a fantastic opportunity. Wow, who wants to who wants to go next? I'd be nervous. <laughs> Tony, Tony smiling. He has no problem following that. Oh, so does Amy. Look at this. Look at this enthusiasm. <laughs> I'll let the two of you figure it out. This is like the best moderating job ever. Yeah. Amy first. <laughs> okay. Well, what I was going to say, the first thing that's come to mind from all this conversation, and when you think of sort of an opportunity that we maybe haven't tapped into, is getting that public consumer buy-in to all of this when you think of the initiative. So we've learned a lot about, you know, who the actors are, what are the different steps, where are some of the, you know, um, opportunities and challenges. But the good thing there is that, you know, the industry is, is you know, for the most part, really wanting to work together and wanting to connect the dots and make it successful. So I think the next place where they could be a huge ally and support is getting sort of the public to understand the value, the benefit, wanting to be advocates for this, pushing for this, because they can look for more municipal dollars. They can get more, you know, get more funding, get more buy-in. They can participate, contribute their own, you know, um, their own, um, you know, support to the projects as well. They can be provided information. They can be, you know, neighborhood advocates for planting and watering and, you know, those types of things, you know, as well. Maintenance, all of those types of things um, that, you know, you could have community groups, all of that, you know, could, could become a huge piece of it. Um, and then getting them to sort of understand and be communicating the, the, the value of, you know, putting this infrastructure in and, and creating this as a long-term investment that's going to build their communities, build their neighborhoods, build their, you know, build their country, all of those types of things. So to me, I think that's a really huge, you know, opportunity of, of, of really that sort of, of that next step. And if them understanding why certain trees, why I can't get the tree that I want or why that's not the ideal tree, a little bit of information is great because, you know, you talk to people and a complaint they have about trees is, oh, it's going to get too big and then I'm just going to have to take it down or it's getting in my root system. And it's like, it's not the tree's fault, right? Like you can put in, but there's better choices. There's better opportunities there. So I think there is, you know, I think there's um, a huge potential there. And I think, you know, the consortium could have a role in that as well of doing some of that outreach because it's a connector role. And so one of those connector groups could be with, you know, with the public and, and providing, you know, some of that information to, to create them as a real ally in, in all of this versus someone that is a, like a challenge or trying to, you know, to get their buy-in is to get them to be really pushing it because they can be a very, very powerful um, um, advocate. Mm -hmm. Great. Amy, thank you so much. And I don't know if I'll ever forget it's not the tree's fault. I just think that is, <laughs> that is a great sound bite, right? That you can just see on so many talks starting off, your whole title would just be, you know, it's not the tree's fault. Tony, o over to you for a last couple words about this uh, this question. And then again, the there's just such enthusiasm. So many people want to ask you all questions. So over to you, Tony, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Yeah, there, there, there's just nothing but opportunity here, right? It's, it's just uh, we've got a, a great job to do. Uh, it's, it's a job that will will leave a legacy. 
it'll, it'll enhance lives. Uh, it's just it's a job that we all want to do, frankly. And and um, I, I'm reminded of a, a Bruce Coburn tune, uh, a line in this one of his songs says, "If you stare at too much concrete, you forget the word the, the earth's alive." And and uh, you know that that's what 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 Jason was was getting at. I mean, maintenance is huge. You know, you can do all the planting in the world, and, and the world is full of, of gardens that were, were were planted and they looked beautiful, and then they were left. So, so, so uh, I would have to agree that that we have a huge opportunity in in raising awareness for the value of of, of maintenance. It's just you know the plants are alive. You know, we need to 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 to, to uh, be sustained with 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 plants need to be sustained. So, so, so I just want to underscore Jason's point. I also want to underscore Amy's point in terms of, of raising awareness of the value and that, that, that drives everything, right? That stimulates the, 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 the demand. Uh, and then uh, I would just add that, that, um, that the engine um, and the consortium's already started it is, is, is communication and collaboration. You know, there's so much that can be done if we're all on the same page and, and we have an opportunity to do that, so. That's it for me. Well, just wonderful. And, and now we'll, we'll turn it over to the audience and uh, the questions are just flowing in. So to, to try to get, you know, with the time we have as many as possible, maybe I'll ask, you know, one person to kind of take each question. And then if someone else says, oh, I have to absolutely jump in on this, happy to have you do so. But we'll just try to make sure we get to as many audience members questions as possible. So. I want to actually start out, uh, I don't know who wants to take this, but Amy, something that you said, I think, uh, corresponds really closely to a question by Phil, and uh, Phil says, there's been a strong push lately to plant nothing but native trees, keeping in mind the motto, planting the right tree in the right place. How strong is the advocacy now to include the planting of cultivar or hybrid tree species? So, so Amy, I asked you that question because you said the right tree in the right place, but yeah. Tony, Jason, or Amy, anyone can take that question. Well, I guess I can say from, you know, like the, the native tree perspective, it, it can be a bit of a buzzword, right? So people understand, I want native because that's, it, it goes to that local, sustainable, organic, you know, you think of the, you know, sort of the food industry, and I think a lot of that kind of transition over. They don't necessarily understand where native means, they just think native is better. But, you know, I have to say planting a native tulip tree in a small urban city lot is probably not your best choice, you know, because it's going to get too big, it's going to get in the way for everything. So I think it goes to, it's the right tree for your area. And so that's where, you know, the municipalities have a role in, you know, or, or the municipalities or the growers or whoever it is along the, the value chain, whether it's the, you know, the contractors, the architect of creating the right species list, you know, of trees that you want. Because, you know, the other thing is, you know, people don't want certain trees because they're too messy or, you know, there's too much cleanup or they dent their cars. So there's a lot of things that, you know, come into play. And, um, you know, so I don't think being native tree or not, I think it's the right tree for the area and one that's going to survive and one that's going to be sustainable and one that's going to provide, you know, the benefit that the, the, the public is looking for. So. Thanks, Amy. And Jason, I just want to say, I mean, your previous example of NVK looking at at the different trees in the nursery, I think also is a great one there to being aware of what's available and, and working together, right? To make some of those choices across the value chain. I think that's a perfect example of, of something to strive for. I think Amy hit that on the head too, because it, let's use what's work. We, um, we tend to be a guinea pig in our industry to try new things and be responsible for new things. And when they don't succeed, then, you know, at, at, when you have a good partner and they can reevaluate, well, that tree variety did not work in this harsh environment and we unfortunately have seen this numerous times where brine is a big problem and you start putting stuff brine on arterial on arterial roadways it is wreaking havoc on some of the species that we've been encountering and planting on and uh, i had an, uh, a project in uh, the region that you know the nursery myself and even some of the architects had concerns with the one variety we were planting a lot of and it absolutely did not work there. And I heard it was because of public opinion really wanted this type of tree. So you really got to make sure we're, we're planting what works, uh, especially in those harsher environments. You want to try something new, that's one thing, but just make sure we're, we're still putting a, a, an effort into 
what works. And unfortunately, it does restrict the amount of maybe options out there, but I've seen non-native stuff do very well in, in harsh environments, and I've seen native stuff do well in harsh environments, but I've also seen the other side of that. So we got to make sure we are kind of reviewing, and that's where this consortium is going to do a lot of stuff where they, they can look at these projects and reevaluate what was used, what wasn't used, and what's working in these harsher environments, and maybe take an uptick into what they want to see in the non-harsh environments that are going to be more successful. Thanks so much, Jason. Tony, I think there's a question here that it's ideal for yourself and your perspective. Uh, Bridget asks, are there actors in the value chain who need to be much more involved? You've spoken at length about making these connections and all the actors. Are there some actors in particular that you would love to see more involved than they are at present? Yeah, like I said before, um, you know, it, it, I almost look at my, my job as, as, you know, trying to cure plant blindness, you know. Uh, the plants, uh, and that, that, that term plant blindness actually is, is a, a research term <laughs> where, where researchers are actually actually tested, you know, what, what people see in, in, in visual representations and, and the green space is actually taken for granted. And, and uh, um, so, so we take the, the, the flora for, for granted, you know, it's, it's, it's there. And, and so the more that we can um, show people uh, you know, show them the why, uh, and that goes beyond the beauty. The, the better it, it is. So, so I think that that's um, uh, yeah, that's how I, I would answer that. Like, the, so who is it exactly? Well, you've got all these homes. Uh, you know, I've got on my own home. I've got maybe fifteen trees. It's a typical suburban lot. You know, with fifteen trees on it. Way too many trees for the for the area. <laughs> But most of my neighbors have two or three trees, right? They could they could all plant more. <laughs> if everyone if everyone planted just one more tree, think of think about that, right? So 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 I think the more the more we encourage people to plant. What about all all the um, industrial, commercial, institutional properties that that Jason's looking after, right? Like how how many more trees can go in, into those properties? Lots, you know. So so start with one. If everyone had just planted one more tree, we 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 double what's here, so so double what we what we plant, you know. So let's start with one more. Uh, let's let's t let's encourage everybody to plant just one more, and then go from there. Then maybe we'll go ten more, <laughs> you know, whatever whatever fits, you know. So there's lots of opportunity here. Wonderful, Tony, and uh, I mean one of the. One of the um, you know actor groups I think that, that we haven't talked about yet today are indigenous peoples and different ways of knowing and different knowledges and and you know that aspect of you know uh, different knowledges could be so important to the value chain and enhancing the value chain and opportunities going forward um, you know so that's a, another actor group certainly as you were talking came up to my mind about like you said if, if we could access these different ways of knowing and, and increase our plantings that would be, you know, tremendously beneficial. Um, Talia has our next question, and it's actually a follow-up for you, Amy. Uh, Talia asks, what strategies did you use to start bridging those gaps in communication between different parties in these conversations, i.e. focus groups? So what we did in terms of, you know, the study that we did was we did um, interviews, um, with one actor group at a time and once we were hearing sort of similar messages from within that actor group then we would move on you know to the you know sort of to the next actor group in the the i guess hypothetical chain we started with so we kind of started off you know talking to darby and and and, and talking to um you know some people in the industry and saying if you were draw a value chain right now what do you think it would look like so we could kind of get our main buckets as a starting point right and so then that's what we did. So we started by talking to the municipalities because, you know, they're looking at the, you know, setting the specifications, they're having the budget, so they're guiding sort of a lot of those next steps. And so based on what they were talking about, they said, well, they deal with the developers and the contractors. So then we went and spoke to them and, and heard what their messages were and what they talked to, and then moved on to sort of, um, you know, the, um, the contractors, the architects, um, 
and you know sort of moved along the chain that way also talking to sort of the nurseries and the suppliers and so part of our approach was if we were talking to the actors within the same group and they were telling us very different things then we didn't have the whole story and we had to keep talking to people but once we were hearing kind of similar challenges similar opportunities similar things and it's like okay this is probably a good starting point for us to be able to kind of build this you know as we go along and to be able to inform this and then another piece of, of it that we did to sort of bring the whole value chain together is, is once we had sort of summarized up all of this information, um, we presented it at a workshop to the industry. Um, I believe it was in February um, that, that um, Darby hosted um, along with, um, I believe it was um, Rita from the CLA. Yeah, it was Rita um, that was part of it. And so again, there we presented all the information and my biggest thing was, okay, how are people going to react? Are they going to be like, oh God, you got it totally wrong. You're missing something completely. You know, who are, who are these? Or are they going to say, yeah, that makes sense because then we probably are thinking of, of most, most of the things. And that was one of the very positives that came out of it is a lot of people were like, yes, I hadn't thought about in terms of flow of products, flow of information and sort of where the gaps are and where maybe it, bottleneck isn't the right word, but where everybody congregates. So when you sort of start looking at where things go, everybody kind of meets in the middle. And so maybe that's where there needs to be more communication, more forecasting, but realizing as well, you have to be realistic as you know, we sort of talked about, it's one thing to live in an ideal world and say, this is the perfect way of doing it. And then the other thing is reality where you have specifications, deadlines, you know, um, other people that are sort of putting pressures on it. So that was sort of the, you know, the, the approach we took, we didn't look at that public consumer aspect of it, because we wanted to get it from more of that industry perspective as a starting point. So that's somewhere to definitely build in. And we also didn't spend a lot of time looking at sort of the the conservation authorities or kind of more of the nonprofits, uh, that could be other areas where we get more information of, of sort of understanding where there could be, you know, opportunities um, and, and building in. And as well with, you know, um, um, other community groups. So, you know, there's there's still lots of areas of opportunity, but that's kind of the, how we gathered the information, how we identified those opportunities and gaps. Amy, thank you so much. And, and I want to certainly say, you know, I know we have a Conservation Authority, who's part of our consortium and, and others that are tuning in today. And I love the fact that we can continue to make those connections that you just illustrated. And I think your work, you know, it's inspirational and, and really informative to the consortium of how we can start making those connections across the value chain. Um, we have time for, for one more line of questioning and I'm gonna pair two questions together because I think this is a good uh, uh, topic for us to kind of uh, maybe end on. Um, so Eric asks that uh, they're keen to plant species at risk, uh, Kentucky coffee, magnolia, cherry birch within our municipality woodlots with the aim of species reestablishment. Are there any restrictions in doing so and issues that would prevent us from going forward? So that's the first question. And the second question by Rebecca, which I think works well together, is given the state of our warming climate, what will native species look like in 10 to 20 years, given that nurseries are growing eight to 10 years in advance? What are we planning for? So kind of two related questions that I think, you know, this, this really uh, is a subject that obviously is on a lot of folks' minds right now. And I think your experience and insights are, are really critical. So whoever wants to start us off on these two, that would be great. So maybe I'll start off on something I don't know a lot about, but but the restrictions question. Uh, I, I don't think that there are any restrictions to, to restoring the landscape. I think the, the, the main restriction would be trying to restore the landscape the way it was if you're going to be planting native trees. I mean, cities are not native environments, right? So, so, so if you're, if you're going to do some, some ecological restoration, then, then you need to, to mimic what was there. And that that'll be the only uh, restriction. No. Amy, Jason, anything you'd like to add? Uh, well, I'm not a hundred percent sure on on where they're going with the um, the reforestation or trying to get more of what what's existing in regards to the coffee trees and stuff like that. I know our success rates with them in in a uh, municipal environment have been very good as long as they're put in appropriate spots. But um, if you're trying to do uh, reforestation style works, I think was part of that question. Um, I've, I've had experiences with some of that 
and as long as we understand if you if you're if you're planting under a canopy with with nursery trees they tend to decline in the luck of the nursery tree from when it's planted to to what it is because it's underbrush and, and you know those if you're looking to kind of let that build as as the as you're trying to reconstruct that um the underbrush typically isn't as strong in nature but they are successful we have had um that type of planting before but uh we've had a little bit of a challenge where the plant just doesn't look as good as when it went in but it's still a viable tree um if, if that's part of the question what they're asking yeah I, I think so just let me reframe it just slightly and then, and then maybe we can get some closing thoughts uh, so really I think the first one was about species at risk and then I think the second question was about you know what will native species look like in 10 to 20 years with our with our warming climate so I don't know if anyone has any last comments about that before I I close things up Tony did you oh hey I see you Oh, yeah, I, Amy I think, uh, sorry, <laughs> Amy, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I was just going to make sort of one comment in that, you know, if you're thinking of your zones and you're thinking of climate change, well, that's what's going to happen. So, you know, I'm based in Niagara. So, you know, we're, you know, in Carolinian Canada and we're, you know, if you keep going north, you get to that northern limit of it. So, yes, with climate change, that, that limit could keep increasing. And so more and more of those, you know, Carolinian species might be able to do well in those regions. But also with climate change, we're getting harsher winters. So while they might grow really well in the summer, they might not do, you know, so well in the winter. And then what are some other pressures that might be, you know, in terms of if you're looking at reforestation in terms of pressures or, um, you know, uh, uh, issues why they, they may not establish well. So it's an ecosystem. So it's 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 a complex question that I, I don't think has an easy answer, but I think with with climate change and we, you know, you can look at other species and how their ranges are, are changing in terms of plants um, and animals and, you know, pests and all of that type of thing that, yeah, definitely it's gonna have an impact on range, but with that comes, you know, other factors, good and bad. And, and I was just going to uh, add that, that uh, you know, Vineland's in a perfect position to do the research and, and let us know, right? <laughs> and and uh, uh, the, the ind industry will respond. I mean, the, the industry does, the nursery industry does its own research as well. They're always, they're always testing plants, uh, try, trying to, 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 you know, bring them as far as they can. So, so, so uh, there's always, I, you know, nature has a huge palette. Right, there, there's there's always plants that that, that will do well. So, based thank on research, you. So. thank you so much. That's a it's a great uh, way to to wrap things up. And so, you know, in bringing today's conversation to a close, there's a couple of key takeaways that that at least I've had, and I just want to reiterate. I mean, I think this idea that when we're talking about the value chain, you know, it's it's uh, as as Amy said, it's not linear, and I think this idea that's a big puzzle really resonated today. Um, the idea that all, all of us are involved together uh, in, in meeting these challenges and success requires that we all work together. I think that's a, a key takeaway. The idea of conveying the value proposition or what is the, the value to the public, to society uh, of, of moving forward in this way is really important. And then I think last but not least, what, what came through loud and clear the entire uh, message was that, you know, the consortium uh, is an opportunity to be a leader in this regard. And, and I'm, I think I'm quoting one of you here where, you know, there's nothing but opportunities ahead. And I just think that's such a, a powerful message as we, we move forward with the consortium together. So um, with, with that, I want to, you know, close today by certainly thanking on behalf of the entire Greening the Landscape Consortium team, our three panelists, Amy, Tony, and Jason, thank you so much for being with us today, sharing your expertise and knowledge, and, and also being uh, just so much darn fun as a group of panelists. I haven't talked this hard in a while. Uh, just, just awesome. I also want to reach out and certainly uh, express my appreciation to our incredible consortium team behind the scenes that makes all this possible and, and runs smoothly. It's the people that you don't see on camera um, you know, that are doing the heavy lifting and making sure that, that it actually works. And uh, the last thing I want to do is wish everybody a wonderful day and say, please stay tuned for more Greening the Landscape conversations in the future. Keep up to date with information by visiting our website, and that's going to come across in your chat. Thanks so much, and I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.